Okay. All right, so now, now let's continue on though. So. Yeah. No, 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 tell no, no, me, no, tell no, me the truth. Let's, 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 let's continue Break on. Break it what, what passage are you discussing? 17, 1. John 17. So, 17 what? And this is eternal life that they may know oh, you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. All right, Jesus the Christ. Jesus is uh, the word uh, Yeshua. Yes. Christ is the uh, Greek word for Messiah, which yes. is comparable to the Hebrew word Messiah. He is the Messiah. The, the Messiah? Yeah. All right. The one whom God has sent. Mm -hmm. I brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me you. within your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Right. So, so, Jesus is, Jesus is claiming no, no, no. Jesus is claiming that he was with the Father before before creation. No, but before before that, when before he says... Before the world began. Yeah, before that, when he says, this is eternal life, that right. they may know you. Who is the you then? Who is the you then? The Father. Okay, so when he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father, the, Father, the only true God, mm -hmm. and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Yes. So according to Jesus, before we go to the next verse, which I will... Um, also bring into context yes first you need to acknowledge according to Jesus who is the only true God there is only one God no, no according to Jesus not you no there is a, according to Jesus there is only one true God and Jesus also and who is said, that and who is that God the Father God the Son no, no. And God according the... to Jesus in that verse oh, they, it's you have to look at the, all of what Jesus had to say not okay. just one verse so let's take one at a time okay first we are starting with John 17 3 because okay. that's what you brought up I don't know how the discussion started he started it yes so what I'm saying is that according to that passage, when he says, you, the only true God, uh, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, right, so, according to that passage, so, it's clear that Jesus is saying that only the Father is the only true God, and that only true God has sent him, who is the Christ. Do you agree? The Christ, yes. Now, who okay, is good. the Christ? Right. So, who is the Christ? No, no, I'm, I'm getting there, yeah, no problem. So. Okay. So, as far as Muslims are concerned, I'm not a Jew, by the way, I'm a Muslim. Yeah, so we, we agree Jesus is the Christ. Yes. We have no but, problem with him what, being the Messiah. What is the nature of the Christ? That is the question. Okay, so as far as Jesus, his community, even the Jews before him, the Messiah was never to be worshipped as God. No, that's not true. Show me why Jesus said any Messiah is to be worshipped as God. He doesn't say any Messiah was to be worshipped as God. Even himself. But if, but, if you, but if you look through the entire Old Testament scriptures, yeah. you will see that if within the context, that that the Hebrew scriptures say that teach that the Messiah, the coming Messiah, the promised one, would be would have the same qualities as God. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Let's so, uh, let's so, think. No, no, wait, wait. This this statement which you just made, yeah. same quality as God. Okay, he, he, which he, God are we talking right, about? So, so quality as which God? The, the, the one true God. Okay, so who's the one true God? There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And, and that's why you differ with Jesus, isn't it? No, because it's not Jesus. Where I with Jesus. John 17 3 which you just read okay let's 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 take a so, let's take a step back what's your what, what's your name by the way Jeff Jeff Peters. I'm Hashim okay Jeff very nice meeting you nice to meet you okay we just want to go a bit that size so you center uh, in the frame yeah that's fine so what I'm saying is that if Jesus in John 17 3 yes which you have acknowledged yes when he says this is eternal life that they know you the father and the oh, I'm coming to that I'm yeah. coming <laughs> you want to jump the gun that's yeah. fine so this is eternal life that they know you the father the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. In that passage, Jesus identifies two persons. That's correct. One person is a father whom he identifies as the only true God. Right. And the other person he identifies as the Christ or the Messiah, which right. is himself. But which then, who was right. sent by the only true God. But, Do you agree? Yes. So as far as this passage is concerned, we have only one true God. Sorry, the only true God is a father. Well, but according to you, wait a second. the only Jesus, true God is Jesus three persons. Jesus does not deny in that passage that he is, that he is God. I'll tell you how we deny it. No. Should I tell you how? No, no, it's no. But well, I'm understand. telling you how. You 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 made a statement. I'm telling you how we may deny that. So if I said, sorry, was it James? Was Jeff. It? Jeff. So if I said Jeff is the only person, yes, who's standing here with a backpack, does that mean there's somebody else with a backpack? Based on that no, statement which I just made, the, if uh, I said Jeff is the only person with a backpack, does it mean the term only is exclusive? You know that. That's correct. Right. Yeah. So if I said 
Je okay, let's say the Bible. Jeff is the only one holding the Bible here. Yes. yes? Would yeah. that mean there are other people holding Bibles here? No, that would be. So it. look, English is quite simple. Right, but Greek so when we look different. at yeah, but we are not speaking Greek. Well, but I read Greek. Well, that wasn't the point here. Well, the point, the, so the but argument. You understand the point. That okay, so in the language. That okay, if you know, if you read Greek, tell me what does it say in Greek? John seventeen three. Translate it. <laughs> you have to look at the phone. You see, because you don't speak Greek, that's the reason. Because if you did, you wouldn't have to look at the phone. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, look. Doesn't matter which language you look at it. The passage will still translate to same that the only true God is the Father. The. Uh, what Jesus is saying there, and again, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Exactly. Now, let's, let's understand the concept and what the definition of the Christ was for his listeners, for the people that Jesus was talking to. Okay, so in the, in all of the prophecies concerning concerning Jesus, who is the Christ, all the prophecies concerning the Messiah that go all the way back to Abraham. Yeah. All right, so he'll be a child of Abraham. No, but why? Why? According to, according to the why have you steered it to the Messiah when Jesus is talking about because, the only true God? Because Jesus is identifying himself as Messiah. No, he's identifying he the only true God as a Father. He says the only true God and Jesus Christ. So this is eternal life. Right, so eternal life equals knowing God the Father and I agree. Jesus. I okay. agree. Jesus the Messiah. Yes, you have okay, to acknowledge so, both of them. Yeah, but there are two uh -huh. persons here, there are and and there's only one person from the two who Jesus acknowledges as the only true God. If you can find wait, me anywhere in the Bible wait, wait a who's wait. called the only true God, you're isolating only the one Father. passage out of the entire New Testament, and you're saying this is the only one that defines everything that we're going to believe about Jesus. No, I did not isolate. No, we're talking about that passage. That's right. But, but if I can you, show you many more. Well, I can show you many more as well. So okay, show me other, where Jesus is the only true God. Gone. But the other the other passages where Jesus says God has given him the authority to give eternal life to whom he wills. He's given all authority into the hand of Jesus. Yeah, but even that, what does it mean? When you say all authority has been given, okay, so there is one person who receives it, and there's another person who gives it. Right. So who gives? Jesus Jesus also says, I lay down my life. Jeff, Jeff, one at a time. Wait, wait a second. You're, 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 you're machine gunning like so no, many different passages. No, Stick I, to one passage. So we dealt with John 7 and 3. We acknowledge based on Jesus that the only true God is the Father and Jesus was a Christ. You now you brought in Christ. Okay, so you're talking about Christ. If so, Christ was given authority, the question right. in, the question that comes to mind is this. Who gave it to him? Well, so let's, let's, let's answer this question first. Yeah, Who on. is the Christ? I told you already, Jesus. All right, so... What qualities does the Christ have according to the scriptures? Okay, so as far as the scripture is concerned, there's nowhere in the scripture where it says the Christ or the Messiah has got qualities of God. That's not true. Show me where. So, so one of the qualities of God is all-knowing. Was Jesus all-knowing? No. Yes. And really? Did he know the last hour? He said he said he did not know. He Thank said, you. No. While he was on earth, yeah. he did not know the last hour. No, he didn't say while on earth. He just says the sun doesn't no, 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 know. No, no, no. You added word no, to no, know. No, no, no. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when the disciples again asked him, is it this time you're going to set up your kingdom? He said, he did not say, I don't know. He said, it is not for you know, to know. So, no, we're not about the kingdom. You're talking about the last hour. Did he know the last hour? Mark yeah. 13, 32. No one knows the hour, not the angels, not right. the sun, right. except the Father alone. Thank yes. you. I'll rest my case right. again. So, during the context of his life on earth, he depended upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit to reveal to him what he needed to know. What do you mean life on earth? Are you saying on life on earth he wasn't fully God? He was fully God. What kind of a fully God depends on anyone? The, uh, so... The understanding of, well, let me go back to this here. God doesn't depend on anyone. There's no question about it. Okay, if you believe that God is all powerful, He's a sovereign Lord, yes, and He created everyone, then the question doesn't even arise that He depends on anyone. The fact that you said that Jesus depends on someone, and the fact that He said that He's ignorant of the last hour, both of that disqualify Him as God. So, in fact, there's another point as well that disqualifies Him as God the fact that He died by His own creation. God doesn't die. 
Okay. The uh, he laid down his life. That's suicide. And he took it back <laughs> up again. That's again somebody else raised him up because there are other passages which says the father raised him up. Okay. And the Holy Spirit raised. And him the Holy Spirit up. raised him up. Right. So, so again, he's dependent on someone to raise him up. So the but the I think you are. By the way, raising up or resurrection yes. still implies that he's mortal, not immortal. Because uh, only mortals need to be resurrected. Someone who is immortal, he does not die, neither is he resurrected. And these qualities are not present in Jesus. According to you, Jesus died and was resurrected. So again, it disqualifies him as God Almighty. The Father is the only one who is Almighty God because even the Holy Spirit cannot say. Remember John 14? He says he cannot speak of his own. He will only say what he hears. Once again, right. someone, all, the Holy Spirit depends three, on is the Father. All three persons of the Godhead throughout the entirety of the New Testament are described as having the characters, characteristics of God. I just showed you the characteristics Jesus and the Holy Spirit don't no, possess. No, you, you yourself said. I use the Bible for that. Mark 13, 32. Right. Jesus didn't know the last hour. Do you agree or disagree? During the time of his life on earth, he did not know He's the He's supposed last to be fully God. So there shouldn't be any period in time where he's wait, ignorant wait, wait, of anything. Wait, wait, wait. Why, why, do, why do you say that? Because God is all-knowing. So, How can an all-knowing entity become ignorant all of a sudden? Because it says in the scriptures yeah. that, that Jesus humbled himself by becoming a man. What does that mean, humbled himself? That, that he debased himself, that he took... What, is, what does debased mean? Be, be more specific, come on. Don't he, play with words because beating around the bush well, doesn't help. Well, actually, he humbled himself. Well, what does it mean, humbled himself? That means he voluntarily made himself to be less by taking on human flesh. So in other words, you're telling me that he lost no. the attributes of God? No. Like all-knowing? No. Like he, immortality? He, he voluntarily laid aside temporarily the uh, the elements of his glory. Okay, Jeff, look, you're an intelligent person, I can see. Okay, can you ever imagine how you can lay aside knowledge? Unless you have some brain damage or some disease, okay? How can you lay aside, when, when, once you have knowledge of certain things, for example, let's say you know your day that you were born, your birthday, yes? Give me a scenario where you would forget your birthday. There are lots of scenarios. Give me, actually, give me, actually, one. Give me one. Four years ago, six years ago, I, I completely forgot how old I was. No, no, forget, forget in the sense that on that day, you don't remember that's your birthday. But if somebody asked you, asked you, Jeff, what is your day of birth? You would know that. I would know that. Exactly. So give me a scenario where you yourself will become completely ignorant of some knowledge which you possess. I think the only things that I can, and correct me if I'm wrong, the only, th the only time you will forget is when you have a certain condition which limits your thinking like maybe you have amnesia or you have some sort of brain damage where you can't recall certain things okay so there has to be an anomaly but when you're perfectly sane when you're like when you're alive you know when you have no anomalies at all either in your health physically or mentally then you cannot say that I forgot something and then call yourself and at the same time say I know that thing because that's a contradiction if God is all-knowing by default and as a Muslim I believe that that Allah God Almighty, yes, in Arabic, he is all knowing. He is Ali Mun Khabir. He is someone who knows and has all knowledge. If that if that God forgets, or if that God in the case of like in the case of Jesus, where he explicitly says, No one knows the hour, not even the Son, except the Father, which you concede it. So so then it shows that there is only one person who, who has all knowledge all the time. And according to your Bible, that is the Father, which is the God of Jesus throughout the Bible. So do you agree with that? No, I don't agree. You don't agree Jesus had a God? I, I do. I, I agree that there is one God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy I'm not asking according to you, I'm asking according to Jesus. And according like, to Jesus. Who is yes. the only true God? When Jesus says that you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power of God. 
exactly right hand of God again sure it doesn't mean that he's God when you sit on the right side of your of your dad that doesn't make you your dad but all according to the New Testament all three persons of the triune Godhead share the same attribute where does it say that it's it's all give me one passage from if you know so if okay, there are so, so many passages so, there should be at least one but yes there is one gone on. uh, so so when in uh, the Gospel of Mark when Jesus said uh, as saying to the paralytic son your sins are forgiven okay and everyone sitting around there said who can forgive sons except God alone okay and Jesus said to them your sins are forgiven not that I forgive your sins so Jesus is no 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 no, 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 the no, message. no wait 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 no because he goes on to say yeah. that you all may know he said which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk he said but that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins he's talking about himself yeah. then he said to the man the paralytic rise up take up your bed and walk yeah so he come he, he had the people who were listening to him said this man blasphemes because he is claiming the ability to forgive sins yeah that's the Jews they always called him a blasphemer remember when Jesus said I and the father are one yes and what did they say they said you blaspheme because you're making yourself exactly to be God and what was they Jesus understood what he was trying to no, say. no no wait a minute if you can take the size of the Jews who were his enemies but I will not so let's see what Jesus actually says in John 10 30 when he says I and the father are one mm -hmm. the Jews pick up stones to throw it in that's correct and what did Jesus say for God for what good works are you stoning me yes right. what did they say the Jews they're claiming to be God you being a mere man are claiming to be God yes 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 and hence you're blaspheming what was Jesus' response to that John 10 34 because that's where the answer is there are many places where the Jews have always labeled him as someone who blasphemes even as a person who is possessed uh, as a person who is uh, possessed by the Satan and so on so read read John 10 30 from the beginning if you want so uh, Jesus answered it is written in the law that uh, that I have said you are gods if these then he said Jesus he called gods to whom the word was given um, and the scripture is not able to be broken Carry on. whom the father sanctified and sent into the world you call that he blasphemes uh, because he said I am son of the son of God exactly what did he say so he said he, he actually is quoting Psalm 82 6 that's correct where he uh, where God himself according to the Old Testament calls the Jewish people the judges I think well he yeah. calls them sons of God uh, and the children of the Most High something like that uh, sons of uh, God and the sons of God okay now if Jesus, Jesus is there is saying that he called God himself calls them gods and all I'm saying is that I'm the son of God which one is greater so Jesus is saying that you are called gods and all I'm saying is I'm sons of God so why are you putting a blame of blasphemy on me see what I mean so Jesus there is telling you that from the Old Testament you guys are supposed to be like even greater uh, in if you're calling me as a mere man to be claiming God then you are called gods directly by God you see what I mean so look Jesus during his ministry yes prayed and worshipped only one person who is God Almighty which is but he the also Father. accepted worship from others no before we go there before look before we go there okay. let's stick to what Jesus did rather than what people perceived about him just like just like over here the Jews perceived him to be a blasphemer which you somehow seem to be citing I don't know why it should be the other way around if you are someone who's following Jesus as a Christian you should then you should love him and Jesus is wait, 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 Jesus let's, said let's, if you let's, let's understand if, though if you love me then follow my teachings so, what was his teachings to obey and worship one person as God and that is the father and he said he said this that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life yeah so what is what does son mean again one and only son you know Ephraim is also called the one and only son Jacob so, is called the firstborn the, there are many yeah. many such passages right, in the Bible you can't take it out of context uh, you need to put it in the context. one that's taking it out of no, context. that's why I asked you what does it mean I'm, I want you to put it in, in context in that context yeah. Jesus is describing himself as the one and only son as the Christ yeah. as the as the promised one yeah you see how you use the term one and only when it comes to Jesus Christ you want to be specific that he can only be the one and only God sorry one and only son nobody else can be 
But when Jesus said the one and only true God is a father, you wanted to then somehow say Jesus is also included in that. This is called double standards, Jeff, with all no, due respect. Not, called, it is, called, because the, the term yes. only is in both cases. But in the case of Jesus, you want to make, make it exclusive, that he's the exclusive but son. But in the case of the father, you don't want to make it exclusive, the only true I, God. He is the only, he is the only true God. But Who is that? God the Father. There you go again. Right. So you're right. going against Jesus. So, when you start saying the only true God is the Trinity, then you're going against the teaching of Jesus. No, I'm not. According to Jesus, the only no. true God is the Father. And no. if you can show me where he said the only true God is the Trinity, then you have a case. Right now, the only case you have which goes against you is John 17, 3. So in, in John chapter 14, mm -hmm. By the way, if you want to discuss the other passages in John 73, you're more than welcome. Again, it points only to the Father, every time. So, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Who is the one who is able to give eternal life? What does that mean? So, when Jesus, when Jesus says that those people who, who believe in him and who follow his teachings will have eternal life. Just like in the Old Testament, you know, when you look at Ezekiel 18, it talks about people who will have eternal life. Yes? So, anyone who is, who is obedient to God, yes, accepts Jesus as a Messiah, accepts his teachings, yes, acknowledges the only true God is a Father, then they will have eternal life. So, because if so you do the will of Father, if, if you do the will of the Father, not the will of the Son. Remember, in, in um, was it Matthew, in, in, in the book of Matthew, where he says that uh, Jesus will call those people who do not do the will of the Father and those who uh, cast out demons and do great miracles in his name. Yes, Matthew 7, is it? Uh, Matthew chapter 7, yes. Yeah, Matthew 7. So it talks about who is going to have that eternal life. And once again, it's those people who follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. So, so in, in Matthew chapter, in John chapter 11, verse 38, yeah. when Jesus says to Mary and Martha, he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Mary's response, Martha's response was, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Okay, Christ so here. when you say when you say he dies, that itself disqualifies him as God. No, it doesn't. Why? Why? Do you, that's that's a category that that's something that you were saying. That's not. You think God can die? The uh, I think that Jesus died. Uh, can God die? The uh, I think that. Uh, don't say I think. Based on the Bible, can God die? So, Jeff, why are you hesitating? It's it's obvious. There's only one immortal, and that is the God of Jesus, not Jesus. So the immortal God. Who is Almighty God, that is the Father according to the Bible, okay? And He's the only one who is immortal. First Timothy chapter 6, verse number 16. It says He alone is immortal. Well, how do you understand the term immortal? You know Greek. What is the term for immortal in Greek? Everlasting. So. No, what no, everlasting is a different word. The term immortal, what is it in Greek? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Shall I tell you? Anastasia. Okay, that is a Greek word and that's the reason I told you earlier, you don't know Greek. So Anastasia means someone who is immortal, someone who is not subject to death. Anastasia means resurrection. No, it doesn't. Look it up. Yeah, it does. Go and look it up. It, it does. Okay, so what is the word for immortal then? I'll have to, I'll, I'll have to look it up. <laughs> I looked at um, the Strong's uh, concordance yeah, that's, and it confirms it's Anastasia. No, that's, well, that's, Anastasia means to be, to be raised from the dead. It, it means resurrection. What okay. passage you're quoting? Uh, First Timothy 6. 16. Anathasian. What is it? Anathasian. Anathasian. What is it? What is it? In, in John 7 and 3? Yeah, this is this is this is First uh, Timothy 6. Yeah, I think that's just a grammatical uh, difference. It's like an no, it's not. Okay, so what is the word for immortal? This, because this is this is the word because thanos is the word that means death. Mm -hmm. So, do you so, want to face the camera if you don't mind? Yeah. So, thanos is the word that means death. Okay. So, a thanos would be without death. And how do you how do you define it? How do you define that term? Well, it's, how do you define the term immortal? 
Eternally living. That's eternal. Two different words. Come on, Jeff. You know English. Yes. What is the term for you? So what is the term immortal defined as? So here's the question. Can you before no, you no, ask no, the here's, question? Here's, here's the question because the the um, to say that Jesus as a human died is not to say that he ceased to exist as God. I never said immortal means cease to exist. That's the reason I asked you. So, what is the definition according to you? So don't put words in my mouth because I never no, said no, no, immortal I, I, die means to cease to exist. I never made that statement. The immortal would be without beginning, without end. That's eternal. Okay. Again, you're misquoting no, no, no. the passage. The passage doesn't say eternal. The passage says immortal. Jeff, how difficult is it to find the term immortal and its definition? Use a dictionary if you have to. As far as I know, immortal is someone who's not subject to death. The reason you're reluctant is because it doesn't apply to Jesus Christ. Just say it. Okay, so immortal, do you agree with me? Immortal means someone who's not subject to that. I'm surprised you have to think about that. No, I'm... It's a simple English term. We use it in everyday language, okay? Well, yeah, if you're you know, there are, a comic fan. No, no, you don't need to be a comic fan. You know, somebody says that somebody drew a portrait and made that person immortalized it in a, in a painting, right. okay? So we use this term all the time, but that immortal but, but, is different. That, that immortal yeah. is different. We are talking about a, a specific subject here, yes? That is God Almighty. One of the things which differentiates God Almighty from us is the fact that He is immortal. We all are mortal, just like Jesus Christ is. Okay? So Jesus Christ, the fact that He died, disqualifies Him as God. You Earlier you said that He has the qualities of God. He doesn't have the quality of immortality. The fact that He, he had to die and resurrect. Death and resurrection both only apply to those who don't die, meaning mortals. No, well, what it says is that He took upon our flesh. He took upon our, our flesh. Yes. God Your himself. flesh was in Him? God took upon the flesh of humanity. Oh, you mean He became a human? He became a human. Okay, so he became less than God then? No. Yes. He, he, uh, the, the way the scripture says it is that he, he emptied himself. Oh, good one. You're, you're referring to, you're referring to uh, Philippians, Philippians yes. yes. So emptied himself of what? Well, he didn't say emptied himself by losing, but emptied himself by taking. No, emptied himself of what? Empty, no, when no, you no, empty no, yourself. I'm quoting the scripture. He emptied himself by taking. Not by losing, by taking the form of a human. But what did he empty himself of? That's you know that's a that's a fantastic question. There have been books written on about that, but, but okay. the scripture actually says he emptied himself not by taking away anything, but by adding no, that's, something. That's no, that's a commentary. No, 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 no. Not about the commentary. No, no, no. I'm no, talking no, about. No, I'm talking about the, what the scripture says. You know, look when you when I empty this bottle, right. is it taking away or no, or, or actually I'm, I'm de depleting it? I'm just actually. Quoting Come on, the scripture. look. You know when you start twisting the. Simple, not, simple words which we no. use in our everyday language. No, 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 no. Then it's just out of but, desperation. But he emptied himself, not by losing. Yeah, no, no, no. It doesn't say by losing. By taking, That's your words. No, by taking. Okay, can you please read it without adding your words in there? Yep. Like the Pharisees. Uh, so, because they like to add words in the scriptures and twist them. So read it, read it, read it from. Uh, I'm just minding yourself. Who though he was in the form, he, if you want. he was in the form of God, which yeah. means that he was equal, equal with God. No, he wasn't equal did to not, God. Did not account equality with God a thing. To be exactly, not equality with God. No, no, that, that doesn't say he wasn't equal to God. Well, that's what it means. No, it does, that's he not did not it count means. equality with God. What does it mean? No, he did not. If I don't count no, equality no, with no, you, no. it means I'm not equal to you. No, he did not. When you start I'm, twisting English, no, you know, I'm to, not twisting English. I, it's like hammering us. No, a, a, a square in a circle. No, you're, no, you're, you're, you're. Reading okay, go on, read it, read it. Go on. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Yeah. But that is to be tightly held on to. Don't but, add your words. Just read it as it is. I'm explaining. No, no, no need to explain. Just read it as it but is. But he emptied himself by taking the form of servant. Exactly. So emptied himself of what? Because no, it doesn't say doesn't. what he emptied himself of. No, he says That's he, why I want to know what you mean by that. He emptied em himself. This is Paul. He said he emptied, emptied himself, himself, by himself by taking the form of a, of a servant. servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death. Thank you. Even so death became, on the cross. Which means he was mortal. He was obedient like a servant. And he he emptied himself of 
What? It doesn't. It, he emptied himself by taking. He no, he didn't himself. say. He no, said, no, no, no. That's what it says. It says he emptied by becoming by taking the form of a, of a servant. servant. Exactly. So when you are the master and you become the servant, what does it make you? Can the master and servant be equal? Sure. Jesus says otherwise. No. Yes. Jesus says the master cannot be the same as the servant. Well, wait a second. Here. Suppose you're you're going against no, Jesus, no, no, man. No, wait a second. Suppose you're the president of the United States. Yeah. Let's say that. Are you American, brother? Probably. <laughs> so I hope you're not a fan of Trump. But anyway, no, no, carry on. Not, not at all. Thank so, God. <laughs> um, but suppose you're the president of the United States. Yeah. And you're the vice president. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Um, you have different powers, different authorities. Suppose you can choose to serve a meal to the vice president. Mm -hmm. You're taking the form of service. Does take, that mean, does that wait, wait, anything about your status? Wait a minute. When you take a meal for someone, it doesn't mean you're a servant. Where do you get that from? You're I, taking, when I feed the poor, I take the meal to them. doesn't make me servant. To the poor people. He took the, well, that, exactly. And that's what, what do you mean, exactly? He, he a takes, servant has a specific the, meaning. He took the form of a servant. Okay, Jeff, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm not condescending you. How would you define a servant? One who serves. Serves whom? Others. His master. So, it's simple, simple English, my friend. So, and like I said, I don't want, I don't want to demean you. I don't want to, um, like, condescend here. But the fact that you are twisting every single English no, word. I'm not. I'm not. Can I'm you, not. you know, I have to keep asking you to define words like servant like master did Jesus not say that the servant is not equal to the master yeah. have you not read your Bible I've read my Bible did he say this in a parable yes no it's not a parable by the way yes it is okay so what is a parable go on what does a parable mean even in a parable you cannot change the meaning so tell me what the parable means when Jesus says the, the master the servant no no wait a minute when, the, when Jesus says the servant is not equal to the master what does he mean so you take a passage in which he's talking about something else now so you're master and servant about the very nature of who he's he is. talking about master no, no, no. and servant what do you mean you can use both words in different contexts and they mean can the servant be the master the master can serve no in the context can the master the, can be a servant okay so what it says if he says okay, say if he says all right so let's begin in the early part of the passage he said he did not consider he said though existing in the form of god all right he was god no in the form of god does god have a form according to you he's spirit remember john 1 14. Right, so so can morphe can doesn't mean morphe doesn't mean his physical form it is talking about the essence of who he is okay adam was created in the form of god explain he was in the in the, in the icon also of god in the image of god not the form of god wait, wait. jesus existed no no wait, form of wait, wait when you're in the form of someone okay what is the form of god according to you well but look how the context disguises it and he said that even though he was in the form of god he did not consider equality with god as something to be grasped the word there means to be high, tightly held on to you know you it means to be seized yeah, as though it's something for him. I'm, 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 ex I'm trying to explain what the word means in English. When I asked you, when I asked you to explain servant and master in English, you were all over the place. Okay. When Jesus explicitly said, wait, 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 wait a second, because Jeff, I'm talking. I'll let you talk. Okay. Okay. When Jesus explicitly said that the master, the servant is not equal to the master, what was the context there? Even as a parable, what was the context? Do you know the passage, by the way? I know the passage. I have to find it. Is it John 13? John 13, 16. Yeah, and so here he goes, says, yeah. Look, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that just as I have done, you should do. Truly I say to you that a servant is not greater than his master, nor than messenger the one that, than the one he sent him. Thank if you. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. 
Okay. Okay. So, so what does it mean when he said, very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. He's saying that you're not greater than I am. Hold on. Read the next bit. Okay. If you know these things, you're blessed. No, 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 no. You, you missed out the most important thing. It says here, this is John 13, 16. It says, very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. That's right. And he's talking about the fact that he is going to be sending out his disciples. Yes. And they are not greater than he is. But you only took the second part. What about the first part? No mas no servant is greater than his master. Who is a servant in that parable? In that, the servant or his disciples. And who is the master? He is. Thank you. Are they equal? No. I rest my case again. Jeff, this is a problem no. with, you, with you. When you read no. the Bible, you ignore English. No. And you ignore the context. No. And then you interpret it every time because your focal point is Jesus is God. When every passage that we read, Jesus was disqualified as God. No, that's not yes, true. Yes, he was. No, he wasn't. Okay, who, who sent Jesus? God just like, Je sent just like Jesus sent the disciples. God who the sent? God Thank the you. Sent so in that scenario, who is the master? He is He is humbled himself. Who is the master? To the will of his father. Who is the only true God who is the master? He said that he always does the will of his father who sent him. Thank you. Which means God the Father is a master. When but the servant... Like, but he is not saying... He never he said he's equal to the Father, did he? Ever? He did. John 10, 30, which we already discussed. Why did he say he's equal to the Father? Even after his ascension, when he says, Paul says that the... All, well, when he says, yeah. I and the Father are one. We discussed that already. Have you forgotten? No, no, yeah, but, but, but we, we discussed part of it. Okay. Okay, so which just, part of that right, says so that he's one when as God? He says, when he says, I and the Father are one. When he says to you, when he says you need to you need to qualify you can't just make a statement like the way we discuss the passage right 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 so when he says that I and the father are one that he is saying that he is equal to the father he is saying that no we yes. discussed it in context and you agreed that in mark sorry in um, in Psalm 82 6 the Jews were called no, gods that, the right, sons so, of the most high right but, but Jesus only says that he is the son of God not that he's God Almighty he so he never wait wait, wait 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 a minute so Jeff from the words of Jesus himself not not the words of Jeff, Jesus is saying over there, he explains himself, he's saying all he's saying is that he's a son of God, which actually means a righteous person, and any any person who is Jewish, right. they understand so, what it means. Right. The, At that time. Yeah. Right. So the the term that he also calls himself is the son of man. So what? Son of man is is a divine title. Right? That's used in the book of Daniel to describe the, the pre-existent God who shows up. You know how many times Ezekiel was called son of God? More than 80 times. No, you guys should really go and read the Bible. No, Unless you're telling me Ezekiel no, no, is also God. No. It's not a divine title. No, no. It just means you're a human. No, no, within the Son context. of man. Son of which person? No, no, no. A man. No, no, no. Not With, God. No, within the context of Daniel chapter 12. Yeah, even Daniel was called son of God, man. You know that. He says, he said, I saw one like the son of man who was eternal. Was Daniel called son of man in the book, same book of Daniel? You don't read your Bible, do you? Yes. Exactly. So it's not a divine title. Come on, bring me something that is worth, worthy of Jesus being Almighty God. Right now, you are really actually helping me out by proving that Jesus is not Almighty God. You know when Jesus was on earth, do you agree that he was the best role model? Yes. There was no one better than him? In fact, there was no one better than Jesus who understood God Almighty. Do you agree? I agree. Good. So, whom did he pray and worship to? He prayed to his father. Why only the father? Why not like you, worship the Trinity? Why did he not advocate to others to worship the Trinity? He did accept worship. That and wasn't they, my question. No, no, no. no don't no, change no, the no, topic. No, no. Don't but, change but, the topic. Here, why would he pray to himself? Hold on, hold on. I'm not saying. Did he pray to the, uh, the the Holy Spirit? He said that he would send the Holy Spirit. That wasn't my question. Did he pray and worship the Holy Spirit? He said the Holy Spirit would be another like See, him. Every no, every said, time you change the subject. No, I'm not. I'm you because you're asking a question that only has one answer. No, because okay. we have when we look at the Bible, when Jesus was asked specifically by the people, how shall we pray? What what was his answer? He says he, he taught them the Lord's Prayer. Thank you. Can you read it, please? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why does he only say our Father who is in heaven? 
why does he not say our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or at least our Father and the Holy Spirit who are in heaven? The, uh, so again, you're you're making a claim about one passage of scripture. I can give you many. How many do you need? John, look, I gave you the Lost Prayer. I gave you John 17:3. I'll give you John 20:17 if you want. I'll give you many more. How many do you need, Jeff? In fact, everything that I quoted to you was explicit. Everything that you quoted, I could actually translate to you. I could give you the exegesis of it from the fact that he was not talking about God Almighty, no, but talking about Jesus as no, a servant of God. No, that's that's your interpretation. From the very beginning uh, of the Christian church, the, the understanding... Why are you bringing the church in? Stick to Jesus. Stick to the Bible. The, this, this, I'm talking about the, the words of the, of the scriptures. In Who the is the head of the, the church? Word, Jesus. Is exactly. The so why don't you listen to the head of the church instead of the church? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Thank me you. will never die. Who is a resurrection? Someone who is mortal, not immortal. Once again, everything goes against you, my friend Jeff. Okay. By the way, you know, when, when Paul, Paul was, uh, Paul should have been a Trinitarian, but he wasn't actually, you know that? He was. Okay. When Paul says, uh, the head of Christ is God, this is long after his ascension. That's you agree? Correct. In yeah. 1 Corinthians 11:3, right. he says, um, "The head of the, uh, the, uh, the head of the woman is um, man. The head of the head of man, um, Christ is the head of man, and the head of Christ is God." So it talks about authority in all three passages. So in, in in this passage, it talks about authority of three different entities. One is the husband over the wife. Do you agree that the uh, the husband has authority over the wife? Yes. Good. Number two, it talks about the authority of Jesus Christ over the people, over men. Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes. He has authority over. The third thing which Paul refers to is the most important. The head of Jesus Christ is God. What do you understand by that? But again, so Jesus is voluntary subordinate to the Father. Voluntary. It wasn't. It, was, it wasn't during his earthly time. This was long after he was ascended. So are you are you saying that he's still subordinate to the Father? Voluntarily so, yes. So, until when is he subordinate? Eternally so. Thank you very much. Again, show the master-servant relationship. So when someone is subordinate, no, no, wait, wait, wait. When someone is subordinate, okay, and trust me, that is not God Almighty. The reason God is called Almighty is because he is not subordinate to anyone. The fact that you're saying that Jesus is eternally subordinate to God Almighty, to the Father uh, in your scripture, it only proves that they're not co-equal. No, it doesn't. Okay, can someone who's co-equal be subordinate to anyone? So, sorry, to the other entity to no. whom he's equal. So let me let me ask another question. No, no, answer this first. So, so can me, someone, if two people are equal, can one be subordinate to the other? Yes. How? You can choose. Sorry, when I say equal, I mean in authority. Yeah. So yes. if two people are equal in authority, yes. Can one can one be subordinate to the other? Yes. Absolutely. Can, how, what are they equal in then? So what are they equal in? So the uh, equal in value, equal in person. No, I said in authority. That's why I made it very clear. Equal in authority. No, so Jeff, Jeff, I made it very clear. Are you the, author the authority. Are you, are no, no, married? we don't talk about that kind of. In fact, you agreed with me. In a marriage, man is the authority. Are you married? <laughs> yes, I am. Is your wife equal to you? In what? In authority? Is your wife equal to in you? In authority? I'm asking a specific question. In, because here the context in, is authority. In terms of. I, but, she's a human, yes. Okay. In humanity, she's equal. But the question is about authority, and that's the reason you want to now change the analogy in order for you to fix. Jesus in once again is Jesus equal in authority with God the Father? Yes. So why did Paul lie then? I should Paul. I don't know. All right. Yeah. Why did Paul lie? You can be equal in authority and choose to be subordinate, subordinate, subservient. You no, can be no, no. equal whoa, 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 whoa. in value. Wait a minute. Wait person. a minute. When equal when the wife being. when the wife is not equal in authority to the husband, okay, only then this husband can be in authority of the wife. Otherwise, there's no point saying the head of the, the head of the woman is man. There's no point in that statement. That statement is is meaningless. It's and this is why this is why you keep changing the meanings of clear passages. And this, you know, that's, with, that's with all due respect, the only people who used to do this are the Pharisees. They used to twist the meanings of the words. And that's the reason Jesus called them snakes and vipers. You are an adulterous nation. This is what the Pharisees, the Jews of that time, okay, who were the leaders in their, in their synagogues and all, they used to twist the passages. That and that's, a, that's exactly, you know, when, when, ex wait a minute, when exclusive, explicit passages are given, you twist the meaning. No. You twist the meaning of immortal. No, 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 no. You twist the meaning of servant. You twist the meaning of authority. 
me. No. I mean, every true. time you twist it, why? Well, because because you are taking a narrow slice of scripture and you are interpreting that in isolation of all of the rest of the New Testament. How many scriptures did I give you? Did you not twist them all? I gave you several passages. You all of them, passages. you misinterpreted. No, that's in fact, you true. change even the meaning of the term immortal. Actually, no, you haven't given us the meaning of immortal. What does immortal mean once again? The undying God. Undying, that's exactly. Did Jesus die? Jesus died. Good. But no, but there you go. <laughs> so there's only one who is immortal, no, and that is a father. You're, when you're asking a question this way, all right, it doesn't. It, it, there's not a logical implication that it, that other things cannot also be true. No, if there is only a specific and explicit passage which says that God is immortal, so, wait, wait, jump, jump. I let you speak. I let you. I let you speak. Okay. Okay. If there's an explicit passage from someone, explicit, not implicit. When it's implicit, you can have several different meanings. But when there's an explicit passage, yes, that God is immortal, right. that he alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, right. whom no man has seen or can see, First Timothy chapter 6, verse number 16, then there is no ambiguity. When he so, says he alone is immortal, wait a minute. When he says he alone is immortal, can anyone other than God Almighty be immortal? Please answer without without asking a counter question. Right. Can anyone other than God Almighty be immortal? No. no. Good. Right. So wait, 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 wait. If you say no, if you say no, that no one other than God Almighty can be immortal, and you are agreeing with that passage where it actually says He alone is immortal. The term alone is just like is exclusive, like only. Because some some other passages actually say He 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 He's only the only one who's immortal is He something like that. Again, it shows exclusivity. If God is only immortal, and the fact that Jesus died, but how can you how can you then reconcile let you, that? Let me ask you a question. This may be yeah, but you need to answer this question. Well, how can you reconcile this passage, which says that God is the only one who is immortal, and the fact that Jesus died? How will you reconcile that to different scenarios? So let me ask you a question. Um, and I was hoping by, for an answer. By way, of, by way of answering the question, let me ask you a question. Go on. If it helps, so, go on. Um, what will happen to you when you die? I will. When I die, yes. my soul separates from my body. Right. And that is what we call death. Right. But I will not cease to exist. Exactly. Okay. Right. I never said. In fact, I don't know why you're saying exactly because I never, I never made that statement right. that when so, you die, you cease to exist. So, right. So, so you will die, and my soul separates from my body. My body will disintegrate. Right. My soul will be in the grave until God wants it, until the the day of uh, resurrection, which we call the day of judgment, right. when God is going to hold us accountable right. for our for, for the life that we led in this world. Right. Now, according to you, what happens when you die? When when I die, my soul goes to, to God until the day of resurrection. What do you mean to God? It doesn't go in the grave? My body goes into the grave. My soul okay. goes uh, to be with Jesus until the day of How do you know it goes to Jesus? Um, what if you're one of those people which Jesus mentions in Matthew 17? Sorry, Matthew 7. Because Jesus promises, he who believes in me will never die. Well, uh, well I believe in Jesus. Right. <laughs> All Muslims believe in Jesus. So we are really good, you know, in the eyes of Jesus. That, that uh, he who believes in me will never die. Um, we believe in Jesus. I'm the resurrection and the life. Is what well, there you go. All right, so, so, all right, so, so we believe in Jesus Christ. So let, look, you asked me about death. Right, we so were discussing right, immortality. Right, right, so, no, Can you please right, get right, so, uh, go back? Well, let me get back in there, so yeah, we can go get to the point. In John chapter 17, 3, which is where this, where this discussion began. Yeah. All right. Jesus says, Father, I have glorified you with my life on earth. All right. So he's going to physically die. He's right there before the before the crucifixion. He's going to physically die. Yeah. Can, you, can you read that scripture from the Bible, if you don't mind? Yeah. In a moment. Yeah, sure. Again, but physically, he will die. Spiritually, he will go back to the Father. Just like you. Right. Just like you. So, so you're not immortal. But, like right. you said, you're, you're mortal. But notice here. But the only Jesus, difference is how Jesus, Jesus died and how you die. But Jesus says, glorify the Son with the glory that I shared with you before the world began. Yeah. So can you open so, the Bible and read that? That's John 73. That's right. yeah. yeah, I know, I know, but I want him to read the passage from the beginning. We'll, we'll
you take it into context, there's a lot which which we can extract from Absolutely. John 17. So, glorify the Son. No, read, read from the beginning. So when Jesus spoke in these words, he lifted his eyes up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Okay, stop Since there. Stop. Is that is that one? Just one. Okay, so let's take one at a time. So first and foremost, Jesus lifted his eye and he's praying to the Father. Yes. Do you agree? Yes. Not to the Trinity. You pray to the Trinity. Wait a minute. I'm just showing you the difference between a Christian and, a, and Jesus Christ. Christians pray to the Trinity. Jesus prays to whom? To the Father only. Okay. So because it only makes sense. Why? Why would he pray to anyone else? Because he's a human. <laughs> <laughs> he's he the took, best role model for a human, took like upon, a human. He took upon human flesh. Exactly, so should he not pray like a human? He does everything else like a human. He eats like a human. He defecates like a human. He right. dies like a human. He's he, given birth like a human. Was, Why does he not pray like a human? He, Which and, is, he was, and he was raised. What do you mean raised? Raised from the dead on the, on the third day. Yeah, so will you. <laughs> if he's no. not on the third day, you will be resurrected as well. No. You will have death. Look, you, you, you had birth. You will have death. You will be resurrected. Unlike unlike me, Jesus never had a beginning. Was he not born? He was born physically. But notice here, so... And also in John 1, it says in the beginning. Wait, wait. in the beginning... Yeah. Where does it say he never had a beginning, by the way? Where in the Bible in does the it say... In the beginning was the Word. Yeah, exactly, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. Not eternally, in the what, beginning. What, in, the, in the beginning was the Word, yes. and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in the beginning, right? Not eternally. Thank you. Show me any passage where it says he was eternal God. So... No, no, don't change the no, topic. No, 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 no. Wait, <laughs> okay, he doesn't have an answer. You asked me... Yes, I asked you. He's a, and now, Father, glorify me. No, no, I glorified no, 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 you. No, Read no, that. No, no. Wait a second. Why did you jump to five? Read well, two. Because, because you asked me, you asked me when did Jesus say he was eternal? And no, I said, you. read from the beginning. Yeah. So we dealt with uh, the first passage. Wait a second. The first verse. Know? Read the second, third, fourth, and then the fifth. Let me let me come back to five here. No, no, don't jump to five. I know you like jumping to five. Let's take it in context. Because context means you read it chrono chronologically. Yes, I know. But so we, can you read it, please? In so we've read two. But since you have given him authority over all flesh yeah. to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Yeah. What does it mean? That means that everyone that has life only in Jesus. No, no, you have given eternal life. So who is given authority to Jesus? God the Father is given authority. Thank to Jesus. you very much. So you know who normally gives authority? The one who has it. Who is the re who receives authority is the one who does not have it. See, so before you, you wait, wait, look, you know the reason the reason I'm explaining each passage is no, no, so no, that no. we understand. I know, but but you're trying to create an antagonistic situation. No, I'm creating no, the, I'm, I'm giving you, you the facts. Trying, you're trying to create an environment, to paint an environment in which there is antagonism between the Father, Son, and Spirit. There's no antagonism. There's, there's a master-servant, there's a master there's father, and a loving son, servant son. relationship. I never said there's antagonism between the two. You're misquoting, misrepresenting, no. and putting words in my mouth. But you're and that is dishonest of you. And that is dishonest of you. everything into a corner. But here, let me, let me go this. Painting yourself in a corner, no, actually, by reading every is, passage. This That's the, the reason you don't want to read it. No, I have no problem reading it. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Okay, so who is the only eternal? Uh, who is the only true God there? The Father. Thank you. And who is the Christ? Jesus. Thank you Jesus again. Christ. Only I, true God. Wait, wait, the wait, Father. But the, no, Not I Jesus. Glor no, let, let me finish here. Yeah. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Okay, stop, that, stop, that, stop. Wait, wait, no. Let I will. Mean, I read five. Let's finish four. Why are you always in a hurry to jump to four? Sorry, to five. Because that is something that you think you have a point there, but you will destroy it so badly that you will not quote it again. So let's read four first. Let's I've read four. I have glorified you. I don't. I don't see this as controversial. No, it's How not. I have you I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Okay, stop there. Glorified whom? The Father. Good. What does glorification mean? Can you glorify someone other than God the Father? Well, in general terms, but in the, uh, the way that Jesus... No, no, in, in that context. In that context, Jesus is talking about giving his life, his purpose. No, no, to... glorifying someone. How do you glorify someone? Like God Almighty. You know, he's praying to God. When you're praying right. to God, you're glorifying God. That's, right. That is actually worship. Do you know that? Yes. I Thank that. you. Yes. So, once again, Jesus is worshiping God. Right. Okay? And then he says, the works that I have accomplished. 
accomplished. I've accomplished all the works. Something, what does it say again? Just read it. I don't want to misquote it. Four, four. Okay. I glorified you on earth, having yeah, accomplished the work that he gave me to do. So this is, remember, this is before the crucifixion. Do you agree? He's point. he's talking about the crucifixion here. No, no, he said he's yes. accomplished. It means he's no, past. No, past tense. No, no, no. He says, accomplished no, is a past says, tense. No, so all the way through the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking about the hour is not yet. The hour is not yet. Exactly. The hour is not yet. And now exactly. in John 17, he says the hour has come. Right? In John chapter 13, it actually the whole passage begins in John chapter 12 with, with the Last Supper. All of this was the last speech that he gave to his disciples. Are you saying this is after the crucifixion? No, I'm saying that this, you. this is the last speech that no, he no, gave. No, no, but is it before the crucifixion or after? Doesn't matter what you say, I'm asking you with regards to the context of that passage. The context, it is very clear that this is before the crucifixion. He's saying the hour has come, which means the time has come for me to be crucified. Jeff, just so exactly, it hasn't, it means it hasn't passed yet. That means the crucifixion did not take place yet. Thank you, you're agreeing with me. Now, why does Jesus say that he has accomplished the works that you gave me before the crucifixion. That is the reason. In fact, you know that Jesus, the Christians, they say that one of the key reasons that he became a man is so that he dies for the sins of the world. But Jesus over here says that wasn't even his main objective. In fact, he's implying that he has accomplished all works that you gave me. Now, why is that? Why did he leave out the most important object, objective of Jesus when he says I've accomplished all works? He's referring He's all through the that you don't you have to understand from John chapter 12 all the way through the end of John chapter 17 he is preparing his disciples for what he is about to do the work has been done the work is is right there he's done everything that was possible now is the last hour the next step is crucifixion okay simple english is the term accomplished past tense or present tense or future tense accomplished it's accomplished is past tense sorry so the uh, and it's used very commonly all through the scriptures if it's past tense that means it should be complete if, all works should be complete it's, it's now don't twist no, wait, wait no 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 wait wait don't twist the passage again no i'm not twisting the passage i'm just talking about how all the way through the old testament all the way through the one of the prophetic senses is the prophetic past all right in in using the past tense as a way of defining something that is certain but this is not a prophecy to... this is something that is accomplished he is accomplished when a prophecy is something that will come to pass even if it's a prophetic tense you're still talking about so, something but, wait 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 but you're still talking about something that is to be uh, which will come to pass and in that context yes prophetic past tense will make sense but here he's saying he has accomplished he's accomplished everything all right so he's preparing okay, look, if you one or two is a passage look, up to you. Look, he's he's preparing. If you look through the passage, the entire if you read through John 12 all the way through John 17, he's preparing the disciples. He's a look, I'm about to go away, I'm about to do all of these things. He's giving them the last message before he goes to the cross. All of these things, and now he says, Look, this is the last step. And he doesn't, but notice here, he doesn't say it is finished. Accomplished is the same thing. In, he doesn't say it is finished until it's on the cross. Accomplished means finished. I've accomplished. It's a synonym of finish exactly. and accomplish so, a synonym. The time so when Jesus done, says, the time I've accomplished is, the works that you have given me, I've it means he has finished it. Do not twist I'm English not twisting. You words are the one and terminology. You are putting words in his mouth. You I'm not. You, you are. Okay. You Which word saying, did I put in his mouth? You, God. You, you made an allegation. No, you were saying. Ba uh, back it up. Go on. You were saying. Substantiate it. You, Which you words were, did I put in the mouth of Jesus? Here, let me, you were saying that, that Jesus said, look, there's nothing more for me to do. He's saying. Look, Did I say that? I said, I said, Jesus is saying, I've accomplished the works that you get, you gave me. I'm, in fact, I'm reading, I'm quoting that passage. So do not accuse me of misinterpreting what Jesus said. You're the one who said that accomplished and finished are somehow two different things. No, they're not. They're the same thing. He's he's pointing forward to his crucifixion. That's the whole point. So why of why does he say I've accomplished the works that God gave me? Why would he say that? When your boss gives you some job to finish and you tell your boss that I finished the work you gave me, does it mean you're going to finish it in the future? You're going to get fired, Jeff, if you do that. Make sure you don't use that English in, at your work. Because every time I gave you explicit passages, you want to twist the meaning. I don't know why. No. It, do not follow the steps of the Pharisees. You seem like a good person. Don't do that. Don't become a snake and a viper like the way Jesus called them. Because they twisted the passages of God. And exactly what the Quran says about in, in, cha uh, in cha chapter 2, verse so 79. Now, now let's come back here for a moment. Yeah, go on. Right. Now your favorite passage, go on, read it. <laughs>
There, there are a lot of favorite passages. He says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Good. What do you understand by that? Jesus is here is saying, uh, Hold on a second. John 17, 5. Um, He's saying that before before the world existed, that he existed in the presence of the Father. Okay. What does the world mean? Is it a creation of God? The world is a creation of God. Yeah, by the way, it's cosmos or universe? It's not necessarily the earth, yeah? World, in that in that context. I'm helping you out here. Okay. You need to thank me for that. <laughs> okay. So again, the, the universe has a beginning. The universe is not eternal. Do you agree? That's correct. So even in that context, Jesus is not talking about eternity. He's talking about the time of creation. And by the way, the Muslims believe this as well, that our souls were present long before our bodies were present. But that's not a, that's not a Christian teaching. I didn't say it was. That's why I said the Muslims believe this. Right. right. So right. You, you need to you need right. to focus. So we doesn't mean that we existed eternally. Similarly, Jesus also his, his soul existed before and God wait that's, a minute wait a minute wait a minute it doesn't mean that he existed with God for eternity that's, that that's passage doesn't said. mean that no but he, no he said but look, since he the says, world look, began says, look the glory that I had with you before, before the world existed the world existed yes not before not since eternity so before the world existed that's doesn't mean eternity it just means before look I mean, what does it what does it mean for Jesus to share the glory of the father where does it say share the glory of the father glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you. Exactly, I had. Not the glory of God. He had a glory of His that God gave Him. Okay? Or, or that God destined for Him depending on whose exegesis you read. Okay? Now wait a minute. What do you need to understand? You're reading into that because... No, I'm not. It never says over there the glory of God. Yes, it does. Where does it say? It says glorify me. He's calling God the Father to glorify Him. Exactly. Read it, read it. With the glory that I had with you exactly. before the world existed. The glory with you doesn't mean glory of you again simple English my friend the, and I don't mean to be condescending you it is because you using your Trinity spectacles which you really need to remove when you read the Bible because every passage you know that was your favorite passage like I said you are dismantle it easily and I no, did you, you know what that no, you know no. you know how the Christian exegesis actually uh, how Augustine and all how they translated this yes it just means that God has destined everyone yes for them to be great or for them to to be, um, I don't know, to be destroyed even. And God has God has determined this long time ago, before he made the creation. Everybody's destiny has already been decreed. And this is what it means. And that's the reason in, in, in verse 4, the condition was that, that he should complete the works that he that God Almighty has given him. And that's the reason after 4 comes 5, verse 5, where he says to glorify him, yes, with the glory that he had before the world existed. Once again, the meaning of that is that before the world existed, God had already decreed everyone's uh, destiny. You're and this is, no, I'm not, I'm not. You, you of are. course, this is a religious no. book. You have to read theology in it. Yeah, but what you're reading, what you're reading, you're doing the twisting. Now, you haven't showed me why Jesus is eternal. Show me why he's eternal. Jesus. And, and by the way, by the way, once while we are reading John 17, you know, earlier you said that uh, Jesus and the Father are one. Do you know that Jesus also said, I and the disciples are one? He prays that the disciples would be one. Let's read, let's read it. John 17, 22. It's in the same chapter. Yes, it is. And this will also dismantle the eternal glory that he's talking about, which Jesus never claimed to. No, he said, just the may, the, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, one. just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that I have given me, you have given me, I have given to them, that may be, they may be one. As we are even, one. Even As we are one. We are one. Exactly. So which glory did he give to the disciples? The glory the believers? was his. No, the glory that God gave him. So it's all the same. If you want to call it the same, that's fine. By the way, earlier you were saying that is a, it, that's the glory of God, right? Yes. So Jesus receives the glory of God. Yes. Okay. Jesus gives the glory of God to whom? In that passage? He gives, well, he gives, he says, I glorify you, so you no, will glorify me. No, no. And whom does he give the glory to? John 17, 22. Read it again. I think you forgot already. I've, 
What is it? The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Okay. So, so the glory which was eternal according to you, or God's glory, that he gave to the disciples, doesn't make the disciples God now. Actually, uh, so that we, the way that the New Testament writers describe it is that we become partakers of the divine nature. Do they become God? What are you doing? Calling for help? No. I'm texting my daughter. Oh, okay. So, That's the, uh, um, do they become God? Jeff, no. if the same glory which God gave according to you, which is eternal glory, or the God's glory, to be more specific, so if Jesus received the glory of God and Jesus gave that same glory to the believers, do the believers become God? Based on your logic. They become partakers of the divine nature according to Peter. Answer the question, do they become God? They do not become God. Thank you very much. So, according to you, anyone who receives the glory of God doesn't become God. I'll rest my case again. Jeff, they become one with God as well. Yes. There you go again. Doesn't, doesn't make them God. So when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, same way, it doesn't make him God. Because the believer is also one with Jesus and God the Father. It doesn't make them God. So by your own Bible, you have been refuted. You argue well. I, I read the Bible well. I read it without I read it without the spectacles of the Trinity. Yeah, you, you so you what do you do? Your, your first name is Hashim. Hashim. Yeah. Anyway, thanks thanks for that. I yes. take that as a compliment. What I'm saying here is that Jeff, I want you to read the Bible without any preconceived ideas, any baggage that you have. If you read it and then you read the Quran. Have you ever read the Quran by the way? Bits and pieces. Okay, maybe you should read it properly. And then ask questions based on the Quran. Have you got any questions from the bits and pieces that you read? No. Okay. So you know what you should do? Have you got a Quran? I can give you a free copy if you want. No, I, I, I've, got, I've got a copy. Okay, good. So you know, you should read both the scriptures. I mean, imagine on the Day of Judgment when you're standing in front of God and you realize that the only true God is Allah. Yes? And by the way, do you know the language of Jesus? What was the language of Jesus? Aramaic. Aramaic. You know what is God in Aramaic? Um. In, uh, in the Old Testament, it would have been Elohim, uh, Adonai. No, it's not Hebrew. I'm asking in Aramaic. Not in, not in Hebrew. Aramaic. There are parts of the, uh, of the Old Testament that are written in Aramaic in the book of Daniel. And, okay. Yeah. If you go to this website called ATUR, you know, like TUR, mm -hmm. yeah, A T O U R dot com. Yes, it's actually an Arabic dic uh, Aramaic dictionary. Just type in the word God. You know what comes up as the result? Is this. Okay, so the word for God is Allah, or depending on the Western Syriac, it's right, so, Allah. Right, so yeah. So it's just because, a, just because, the vowels they use. Because the the a h ending yeah. is uh, is was typically used in like uh, in Joshua is the Lord is the, the Lord yeah. saves. But we are not talking about Hebrew. We are talking about Aramaic here. Well, but Aramaic is a, it's yeah, it's a sister language, language. It's and same like the Arabic right. is a sister language right. as well. Right. So imagine God being called Allah or Allah, yes? So. Now, which is closer? Yahweh or Allah? Jesus' own words would be, you know, in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that Adonai. this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true Allah, yes? And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is like the, uh, the Shahada which we Muslims say that La ilaha illallah, that there is no God except Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. You know, similar. But in the case of Jesus, obviously, at his time, Prophet Muhammad didn't exist. So he was this, uh, the Christ or the Messiah, he was sent. Now, imagine on the Day of Judgment, yes, you're standing in front of God, and God says that everyone who praised or considered Jesus as God are, going, are destined for hell. Yes? You know, we, I'm saying, if that was the case, then how would you respond on that day? Because when you read the Bible, the Bible gives you enough hints to show you that Jesus is not God. You know, even in Matthew so, seven twenty one. That's no. So you, again, you're you're taking a lot of passages and you've not looked at them within the context of the whole. You know, when somebody gives a lot of passages and they all make sense, then you should actually rethink your strategy. 
Because someone who doesn't have a good reputation, they will only give you one passage and base everything on that. I give you a lot of passages and every passage I gave you right. proved to you that Jesus wasn't God Almighty. Now, you know when in Matthew 7, 21, yes, when he says, um, let me just quote it here. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Why does it say only the will of the Father? Why not the will of the Trinity? All the way through Jesus' earthly ministry, he continued pointing, pointing people to the Father. Exactly, because he was the best role model. He knew God better than anyone else. So if the Messiah himself is telling you that you have to do only the will of the Father and not the will of the Holy Spirit, yes, because everyone says that we, the Holy Spirit gives us this, I don't know, some sort of um, inspiration and to do things. Why does he say the will of the Father only and not the will of the Holy, Holy Trinity? He says, he carries on. He says- Is that the same? No, they're not the same. He says, oh, yeah. if they were the same, then you would say the will of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. But he didn't say that. He said the will of the Father. He says many, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So you're calling Jesus Lord, Lord. Yes. And until you do the will of the Father only, then you won't go to heaven. This is Matthew 7, 21, your own, your own gospel in your Bible. Right. And then he carries on to say, many will say, me, uh, say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Who prophesies in the name of Jesus today? Muslims, Jews, Hindus, who does? He was talking about the people who claim the name of Jesus. No, who prophesies in the name of Jesus? Come on, that's Christians. a simple question. He, Thank he you. Is a yes. Okay, so no one else other than Christians. Now, if you're going to talk about bad Christians, good Christians, that's a different matter. I'm just quoting well, the passage here. That's the, the point that he makes. Is that he's not talking about the the people that there are, are people who prophesy in his name and are in his presence, and there are people who prophesy in his name and are re removed from his presence. He never said that. That's your words. Where did he say that? He never said that. In fact, he goes. He he says, many will say to me on that day, which is um, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons? Who drives out demons in the name of Jesus? Again, Christians. And in your name perform many miracles. Who performs miracles in the name of Jesus? Again, Christians. Whether you want to call them heretics, bad Christians, whatever Christians, the point still remains. It's the Christians. Okay, Jesus is talking about. And then, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me you evil doers or so, as some uh, bibles passages say away from me the ones who are un not righteous right. or the ones right. who don't who but, don't follow the bible again, the, the so, teachings so, but but the whole context of his statement is that how do you just separate true prophets true people true disciples true prophets from false prophets where in that passage does it say true and false prophets? Pharaoh, false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves you will recognize them by your fruits so that's well, but where does it talk about people who who cast out demons or who, who, do, who so, do things in the name of Jesus? This is the same context. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, It's not the same kingdom. context. It's, it's a different same, context. It's the same context. No, it's not. Even the title is different there. It's it's within two sentences of what Jesus is. He's, it's the same talk. He's talking, it's two sentences later. He said, Beware of false prophets who come to you as sheep's clothing. And then he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter this kingdom. It talks about the good fruit and the bad fruit. Yes. Now, wait a minute. When, when somebody says, Okay, that uh, I cast out demons in the name of Jesus, or I do miracles, in the book of Acts, actually. or I do miracles in the name of Jesus. Okay. What was the other one? There was a third one. Yeah, I prophesy in your name. Now, if a Christian does this, and his prophecy comes true. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Then what are you going to do? Be a... Are you going to call him a good Christian or bad Christian? Because his fruit came true. No, because what Jesus is talking about, have you recognize a good or a false prophet, their life is going to be consistent with what they teach. And they can't call Jesus Lord on the one hand while refusing to care for the poor and, and care for and love others. No, but it, it specifically says, do the will of the Father. That's right. Now, why would prophets be called to do only the will of the Father and the other Christians not? So it's not talking about the, it's not talking about the prophets only. It's talking about everyone. And that's why I said it's a different context there. No, it's the same context. And Jesus on that day will plainly tell you, yes, get away from me, 
you doers of you workers of iniquity, workers of iniquity, or you evil doers, yes. or basically those people who go against the law. And that's the reason he says, "Do the will of the Father," because that is what Jesus brought to them. Uh, sorry, what Moses brought to them, and Jesus practiced as well. Right. But anyway, I think we look. What you need to do is you need to read the Quran, read it in context, because again, we have a lot of commonality. You know, there are many prophets in the Quran. Yes. yes. In fact, all the prophets. Who are the only people who consider Jesus to be the Messiah other than the Christians? Muslims. Exactly. So we don't reject Jesus. We accept him. What we want to do is we want to reject the false attribution to Jesus that he is God when he never claimed to be God. When he said the only the only true God is the Father. Okay. Uh, no need to go into that because we already discussed it. Watch the video. Okay. So that's why I'm saying if we want to take away the false attributions to Jesus, that many of these people who consider themselves to be Christians or Jews, because the Jews have a lot of uh, blasphemy uh, against Jesus, many of the things that they see against Jesus are false. The fact that he's not the Messiah itself is false because we both consider him to be the Messiah. The only difference is you raise the Messiah to the pedestal of God, we keep him as the Jews actually do. You know, we take a part of the Jews, which is good, that the Messiah is someone who's going to not be God Almighty, but who knows God and who's going to talk about God, and the Jesus and 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 the Bible, uh, sorry, the Christians who consider him to be Messiah, but then they attribute a lot of things which can only be attributed to God. But when we read the Bible, none of those are true. So what I'm telling you is that read the Quran in context, because like I said, there is a lot of commonality which we can learn from. Yes, and if you read the Quran, you'll see that Jesus is someone who is respected and revered, and so is his mother. You know, his mother is the one who is uh, blessed. There's only one woman who's mentioned my name in the Quran, and that is Maryam, or Mary as you call him uh, in English. So what I'm saying is that he's respected, Jesus, respect, Jesus is called Isa ibn Maryam, yes, and he's the Messiah, he's the one who's blessed. In fact, we believe in the second coming as well, I didn't know, I don't know if you knew that. Yes. We believe in the, we believe in the second coming, we believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, the miraculous birth, and the miracles that he did, yes, like it says in the book of Acts, yes, that he's a man accredited by God, who does wonders uh, and miracles, yes, by by God, all right, or, or through, through uh, from God through Jesus. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. The fact that he was able to do all these great things is because God gave him those abilities. Just like Moses was able to do miracles, just like uh, the other prophets who were uh, doing miracles, you know. Similarly, we believe in Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he was again accredited by God. He did uh, he did miracles as well. And he, he actually had many prophecies. And in fact, one of the prophecies from the Old Testament where it talks about Ishmael and that uh, God blesses him that he'll have a great uh, um, sorry, he'll have, uh, he'll, um, his progeny will grow in great numbers. You know when that prophecy came true? Yeah, tell me. After the advent of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Arabs were unknown. Yes, no one even respected them because of their uh, the uncivilized behavior they had. Like for example, they used to bury their daughters alive. Yes, they used to have tribal wars on um, insignificant things. Yes, for for decades and sometimes for generations. So these people had certain characteristics which we wouldn't call to be righteous in that terms. So God sent a prophet to them and these people then changed so much that it became this land which was filled with idols and with pagan worship yes they started to worship only one true God yes the God of Muhammad the God of Jesus the God of Moses the God of Jacob the God of Abraham peace be upon all of them and this is what we see as the fruits today like you said you know the prophets by the fruits the fruits are take them out of this paganism take them out of this false worship yes towards the god which jesus would have called allah this is what islam teaches us and islam teaches us also that the christians and the jews are the people of the book you know why they call people of the book because for you also just like for us your book is quite important and that's the reason i use the bible which you consider to be the book of god yes i use that as a reference point to show you that even in this book to this day even after it by the way we believe that these books are corrupted not everything there is some there's remnants of truth in there still yes and this is what 
what we actually believe about the Bible as well. That there, are, there is truth in that. That when he says that God is one, and that he defined this God as a single entity, so, not a trinity. So when were the, how were the books corrupted? How, like I showed you. No, 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 how were the books, what, what is different, what was different in the original Gospels that was, that is not, that is, uh, that is different from the Gospel that we have today? How will you compare when you don't have the original Gospels? Well, let's say, forget the originals, okay, because I don't think anybody has any original manuscripts from, from the time of their prophet or messenger. We can have something close, but not from that time because there are so many factors which will destroy this papyri or whatever they were, parchments they were written on. So the question is this, what do you think is the earliest manuscript of any gospel? Extant manuscript. There are, we have fragments of the Gospel of John that date uh, the, to within 20 years of when the right Gospel of John was written Remem found in Alexandria. No, no, remember what I said. I said manuscript evidence. I didn't ask you when I didn't ask you when it was written. No, there, there, there is manuscript evidence. Have, so, you, have you actually investigated it yourself or is yes. a hearsay thing? No. If you can find that manuscript, you'll get a really a really good uh, literary prize or whatever prize they have. No, it's, it, there's, <laughs> it's, it's a fragment of the Gospel of John. It's a portion of the Gospel of John yeah. that was found in Alexandria. That is dated to within 20 years of the, of the writing of the gospel. No, it's not. The one you're talking about is P52, which is actually here in the United, United Kingdom. Yes. It's in the John Rylands. Yes, uh, John Rylands. Exactly. Yes. yes. Do you know how old that is? It was dated to within 118. Not 118. Even later, even later. So either the late uh, second century. No, no. Well, you you go and look at uh, the people who actually dated it, and they have different dating. Some of them say after 100 years, 120 years or something. Not 20 years, by the way. 120 years no, after Jesus. 20 years. 20. No, it's not 20 years. P52. Are you sure? 118. So that's 100. You know when was Jesus? 4 BC to about 30 BC. Right. 4 BC, no. The, do you know how the calendar works? Yes. Based I, on I the. I get it. Yeah, no, I get it. But so it's not BC. Most, BC means before Christ. Yes, I understand that. Most, Once again, do you know when the Gospel was written? The Gospel of John was written around 90 AD. Good, so it cannot be 20 years after Jesus, can it? I said, tw I said 20 years after the Gospel was written. 20 years. Okay, so 90 plus. 20, 110, 110, still not 118. Anyway, look. So, I, so 20 to 30? No, no, that, this is, by the way, this is one opinion, yes, but there are other people who actually dated the P52 to be late second century, which is, and even early third century. So anyway, by the way, that is only a credit card size. Yeah, I understand. Okay, it's, it's, so it's so you cannot base you cannot base your gospel based on a credit card size it's, it's fragment. It's one piece. We have 5,000, over 5,000 Greek yeah. and and we have so many writings from the early church fathers. By the way, writing... you know all those 5,000? When was the majority from? Eighth century afterwards. What was what that? Eighth century. Afterwards. Remember this, eighth century. Byzantine, yes. 800 years or 700 years. Yeah, by the way, um, Bart Ehrman says ninth century onwards, majority of them. Yeah. In fact, he says 94% are of those 55,000 which you quote are from the 9th century onwards yeah. now if something is seven eight or nine eight hundred years after jesus christ would you believe it the, uh, you have a gap of seven eight hundred years but we don't really we don't no but you do but if 94 percent of the manuscripts no, are from that century onwards that's not how textual criticism works but we have we also not only do we have all of that but we also have the writings of all of the church fathers and you could recreate the entire new testament no you can't yes you can from, no, you the, can't. from the quotings of yeah from the quotes of the, of the early church fathers we have writings of the church fathers the early church fathers Papias, for example okay. was a disciple of john the, john the, and he never mentioned john he did mention john uh, uh, sorry, that was Polycarp. Polycarp. Polycarp did not mention John. Right. So Polycarp was also one of the disciples, right? He was a, he was an early early uh, Christian. He, he was a disciple of John, Paul, um, or Paul. Anyway, so, so it might Polycarp, be John. Polycarp. Polycarp yeah. wrote a, what I'm wrote look, what I'm saying is that because you don't have the Gospels, if you have the writings of the early church fathers, even that was the church fathers are like how old? What is the earliest writings you have? Again, three four hundred years, right? No, At we, least we, we know when they existed. We know when they wrote. When was the Bible canonized? The, the Bible was canonized when it was all 
third century. No, Three much years. later. Three but, you're talking about Nicaea. I'm going to go with Nicaea. It wasn't canonized during Nicaea. Much later. So, yeah, well, but see, but the, the in fact, they did not act. Actually, they did not act at uh, Revelations until the end. Probably even the fifth century. The uh, but you're talking about two different processes here. So the the act of canonization took place over here, but the but the writings were recognized even as early as the middle of the, of the second century. These are the writings that were yeah. received by you, the church. You remember we were talking about, your question was, why do you think it's corrupted? Now, the reason I'm saying it's corrupted is because all these manuscripts are so late that no one can even go by them because, in fact, in that's, fact, someone... That's not true. No, no, I'll tell you why it's true. In we, fact, you know when Dr. Bart Ehrman says that there are as many anomalies, as many anomalies in these 55,000 or whatever thousands of manuscripts that we have, as many words that are in the New Testament. Sure. That's sure. No problem. So corruption is no problem? Now? Why do you ask me if it's corrupted? No, no, no. no it's, it, if there are anomalies, it means corruption. Do you not realize that? There are... There are misspellings of words. No, there are entire books missing. I'll no. give you. I'll give you two examples. You know, before the canonization, fourth century. Yes, the Shepherd of Hermes, the Epistle right. of Barnum, Epistle right. of Barnabas were missing from the Vaticanus. They were never from, considered canonical. Exactly my point. They were so when they, when it they was were, canonized, they were never received. Jeff, by Jeff, the Jeff, hold on. When it was canonized, they removed these things. They removed these books which they considered as apocryphal later on. But before that, they considered it to be the Word of God. No, they never. Were, they were never considered to be the Word of God. So you're saying the Bible at that time wasn't the Bible? I was saying that the, the scriptures that we have, what we have as the New Testament, were received from the very beginning by the church as being authoritative. My point exactly. So yes. the ones which they had in the possession wasn't authoritative. Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, both of these are 4th century. Were they the books of the Bible or not? Sorry, were they actually considered authoritative, uh, sorry, were they considered as valid Bibles to be read and to be considered as the book of God or not? I'd have to go back and look and see what all was included in Sinaiticus. So all these, all these Christians who claimed early Bibles, like the Codex Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, you're just going to push them under the bus if you say they are not worth, worthy of even being called Bibles. I'm saying that the, the letters of the New Testament, the, the writings of the New Testament that were considered to be authoritative by the church, that were received by the church, and this is why they were later canonized, as right, they were looking back and saying which of the books were received by the church in their very beginning as being authoritative. And that's where we And what were the others called? Deuterocanonicals. Apocrypha. Right, right. What does apocrypha mean? Hidden. But that's a Deuterocanonical. No, no, I don't mean the literal meaning. What does it mean in the context of this? The, uh, the church fathers rejecting them. It means that they did not consider them to be authoritative scripture. Thank you. That goes to, so, That is exactly what I mean by corruption. So your church had to actually, after 400 years, they had to sit down and then decide this book belongs in the Bible, this book doesn't. No. Wait, 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 wait a minute. No, if, no, if, no, I know no, it's not as simple. I'm, I know it's not as simplistic as that, but I'm giving you the gist of what happened actually. No, what, what First and foremost, who gave them the authority to decide what is supposed to be in the Bible or not? Well, they derived that from the authority of Jesus. Said, no, no, who gave them? They didn't exist. They didn't exist in the time of Jesus. So who gave them the authority? This is 400 years after Jesus. Because oh, sorry, 300 years after Jesus. These are the bishops of the church. Exactly. So who gave them the authority? They were appointed. Self-appointed. Not self-appointed. Well, by the other church fathers, self-appointed. Not by God or by Jesus. You see, this is the difference between the Quran and the Bible. In the case of the Quran, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu the entire Quran was completed. Yes, they memorized it and they, uh, they propagated it primarily from memory. Even today, you know, we have people who memorize the Quran. Mm -hmm. You must have heard of them. Yeah. Yes. In fact, there are anywhere around 15 to 17 million people around the world who have memorized the Quran. Do you know anyone who's memorized the Bible or even just the New Testament? Uh, no, people who have memorized quite a bit. No, have they memorized the entire New Testament? No. We have children as young as six years old who have memorized it from cover to cover. And most of these children, even the first language is not Arabic. You know why? Because Allah says in the Quran that he has made it easy easy and this is one of the I would say it is something which is a miracle in itself because no other book has been memorized at such an early age by children whose first language is not what they're reading or what they're memorizing this is a miracle which you'll only find in Islam 
So the beauty of Islam is such that not only that we have the original Quran in the original language. What is the original language you think Jesus uh, preached in? He preached in Aramaic. Good. Do you have any early manuscripts of Aramaic the Gospels? New, New Testament was written in, in Greek. Exactly. So you don't have anything written in Aramaic, right? It was written in the language that the people were speaking to, that they were... I asked you the original language Jesus preached. You said Aramaic. Do you have any early manuscripts in Aramaic? No. Good. The, the, so not even the original language. The Forget about the early manuscripts. You don't even have the original language. We have the original language. We have the early manuscripts. You know where is the earliest manuscript of the Quran? Just like the early, one of the earliest pamphlets or sorry, uh, fragments of the Bible is again in the UK. It's in the Birmingham University. Yes, it's called the Birmingham Manuscripts. It has been dated from the time of Prophet Muhammad In fact, they, they dated to about a few decades, 20, sorry, 20 or 30 max. Yes. So we have the manuscript. And by the way, that's not the only one. We have many other manuscripts. We have the Sana manuscript. We have the Tokapi manuscripts. And all of these are within the 100 years after Prophet Muhammad right. You have zero manuscripts from within time of Jesus, 100 years after him. Okay, zero manuscripts. And this is the difference between the Quran. So original language, we have the manuscript evidence, we have the oral tradition. And, and you know how the oral tradition works? Let me tell you how, how uh, what do you say, uh, important it is to preserve the every letter and every word in the in the Quran that they have a chain of um, of, propag of uh, propagation okay there's a chain of narration for the hadith yes and the chain of propagation for the Quran yes so they propagate from the from the teacher to the student and this student then becomes a teacher and then to their student so on yes sorry the chain of transmission as a correct word so they have the chain of transmission for the Quran and everyone who memorizes the Quran, the Hafiz, that teacher gives them a Sanat, which is a chain of transmission. And it, all of that, all the time goes all the way to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we can actually uh, see how it has been transmitted from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until that student, the last student who's memorized it. And then when he becomes a teacher and then he teaches, pass it on to his student, that will be included in the chain. So you see, my friend, the Quran is perfectly preserved in the original language with the or original words and even the pronunciation. You know, we have we have Qadis. So they learn how to pronounce every word in the Quran exactly without changing the meaning. And even that is preserved. This is how significant it is in comparison to the Bible. And that's the reason we believe that the Bible has been corrupted over time. We have people who are not Muslims like Dr. Baderman who have actually exposed this, that the Bible has been corrupted and many things you know all those red letters you read in the Bible which are supposed to be the words of Jesus these are just assumptions from people that this Jesus spoke those words this is not exact verbatim the words of Jesus Christ it's called the ipsism of verba yes ipsism of box it's yes. talking about preserving the voice of Jesus yeah so it can be something which is paraphrased right so can it be paraphrased so wait a second it's which the, is not exact the original manuscripts were written in Greek that's what that's what Matthew wrote that's what Mark wrote, that's what John wrote, that's what Luke wrote, that's what Paul wrote, that's what Peter wrote. They wrote these manuscripts in Greek. How can someone like John, who was a fisherman, write fluent Greek? You tell me. His, his Greek is actually pretty easy. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Not to the level that they wrote. Oh yeah, John. John's easy Greek. I don't think so. Yes, it, yeah, trust me. So it's, at that time, and by the way, John's this is very easy. This Greek. is the argument of again someone who's a New Testament scholar like Bart Ehrman. So well, it's not your. I know. Wait, Bart Ehrman is a, is, a, is a New Testament scholar, but he's not the only New Testament. Scholar. I didn't say he was the only one. I said he's a, unlike so, you and but me. He, but he's he, also an atheist. So yes, you're quoting an atheist. But he he was an ex-Christian. You're quoting an atheist. He's an ex-Christian. He, no, he's an atheist. Uh, doesn't matter. He's an expert yeah. in that field. You're, you and I are not. He is a he is a he is an axe to grind. So you're quoting. Why do you think he has an axe to grind? Do, do you think that whatever works that he produces, people would not, I don't know, carry to shreds if it was the case? The fact that they cannot produce any manuscript from the hundred years within uh, within hundred years of Jesus. The fact you cannot produce the original language even. The fact that people like Matthew, who were fishermen, would speak influent Greek. I think these are 
valid points. No, that's not that's not a valid point. They were there was Greek was spoken all through the area where they lived. So was Aramaic. So with Greek, Aramaic, Latin, they were all spoken in that area. Yeah, but the point remains the, the, the teaching the, the teaching was in Aramaic, of which you have zero manuscript from the early from the early period. He didn't Jesus didn't write anything. His disciples did, and his disciples wrote for their audience, and their audiences were reading in Greek. Would it not be more plausible for his disciples to write in in in, in Aramaic? No. Why not? Because they had the Septuagint in Greek, which was also translated in the language. No, but Septuagint is the Old Testament. We're not talking about that. Well, We're talking about the New Testament. But the Septuagint was translated 200 years before the birth of Christ so that the people of God could read it in their own language. Why? Which was Greek at that time. No, which was Aramaic at that time. You agree it. So in fact, just, Greek was the second language that was, it was used. Second and it wasn't, it wasn't by everyone. It, was, okay? but it, it was, wasn't spoken by everyone. But it was the, the Greek was the common language that they would all, that, that they would all speak, even if they did not speak Hebrew. Aramaic. It doesn't matter. The, it doesn't point, matter. the, point, the is, point still remains. The point why did they not have it in Aramaic? Because they wrote in Greek. Why I didn't ask you what they wrote in. I asked you why did they not write in Aramaic? Could they write Aramaic or not? I have no clue. <laughs> you have clue about the, the other language, but not this language. Why? I have no clue. Whether okay. Anyway, look. The point. I, look. But why I'm you know, they did, I can give you. I can give you many other ex examples, like the end of Mark 16, the long ending and the short ending. Yeah. Which one do you agree with? Short ending. Why? Because that's some of the, most manuscripts agree with that. So it's the majority you look at, yeah? No, you look at the earliest manuscripts. You don't have any earliest manuscripts. The earliest manuscripts don't include the end in the, uh, the Gospel of Mark. Okay. So the later manuscripts is a corruption? The later manuscripts add things. Corruption? Go on, say it, corruption. It's not. It's a cash 22, mate. For an American, you should understand that phrase. Yeah, I understand that. I understand the phrase. Okay, so well, if you say it is not a corruption, so it must be true. If you say it was a corruption, you're still in hot water because we were trying to prove, or your question was, where, where is no, the but, Bible corrupted? But, no, the, the, <laughs> cash 22, mate. No, you can't get out of it. Not a, it's not a cash 22. it is. Because, because here's the thing. By saying that contextual criticism, right? As these documents were copied, they made mistakes in copying. There's a copyist error. So no, no, a long ending is not a copy's error. It's extra bits. Extra bits. So yeah. it can't be a copy's error. Well, it's a corruption. When you add to the word of God, right. okay, what did Jesus call the Pharisees? Then there are all sorts of places where where scribes made additions and... and additions. But, but additions. Wait, wait, wait. But here's no, no, hold on, hold on. Additions is corruption. Here's Nige, here's when you take away things and you add things and you twist things, all of this is all right, but, corruption. But let's 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 clarify. All of the New Testament writers in every single manuscript, they all agree that Jesus died on the cross, that he was buried, and he was raised again on the third day. Every single manuscript agrees on the major testimony of the events of Jesus' life. Yeah, but we don't have any evidence for that, do we? Yes, we do. Do we have any any eyewitness evidence? Yes, we do. Where Peter, is the evidence? Peter says we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. No, no, eyewitness to the man, uh, to the crucifixion. I, John says that which we've seen with our eyes, that are heard with our ears, that our hands are crucifixion. Are right Stop right. twisting. I know. I know that all those are different contexts. Do you have any evidence, eyewitness evidence, eyewitness evidence of the crucifixion? We have four gospels written by four different. People. Can you name an eyewitness? Call name me. An Eyewitness. John, who saw the crucifixion, who saw the crucifixion, he was standing there. Where does it say that? He was standing at the cross, and Jesus said, "Where does it say this, John?" Behold, behold, he said, to the, "The disciple whom Jesus loved, who is John." Why was it John, only John? Because that's how John refers to himself in the Gospel of John. No, but how do you know John even wrote the Gospel? Do you really? Well, by the way, do you actually think that Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John were written by these people whom whom they have been attributed to? Yes. No, yes. you really have to go and look at. Textual no. criticism and all the author. By the way, this is kind of unanimous amongst the text, uh, the people who are experts, even the Christians, who are experts in the New Testament. Yes, and 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 its uh, history that they cannot prove that these people to whom, by the way, you know, early they were not called Gospel of, according to Mark, according to Matthew. They were they didn't even have names. It came about later on. Please go and study, Jeff. Don't just jump and assume things because I've, I've anyone who says. No, no, you haven't. Yeah, I have. Okay, sure. Give me a name of any credible textual 
uh, sorry, New Testament scholar who says that these people wrote it. Um, D. A. Carson, uh, John Stott, who was here in England. Yeah. Um, where did, where did the say? Bishop of Canterbury. These are not textual critics. They are textual critics. I mean, they're not Carson. experts in the. D. A. Carson is a, is an expert in all of these things. Okay. What what is the expert in? Go and look it up. He, D. A. Carson is yeah. an expert in. Uh, and where did he say it? That the four gospels were written by these four people. Uh, well, he wrote commentaries on Matthew, Mark, and. Ed. No, that wasn't my question. I didn't ask so, you. So uh, he's yeah, actually Jesus. You need to bring to me bring to me the evidence where he actually explicitly says that the Gospel of John was written by John, or the Gospel of Matthew was written by Matthew. Well, D. A. Carson wrote like seventy five books. So doesn't matter. In, which, okay, so, so there should be at least one book in which he references. Yeah, yes. There so bring is. that evidence for me. Until then. I don't think we have a say other than it's your word against my word, okay? But as far as I know, most of these New Testament scholars, they more or less agree that they haven't written, these four people haven't written the gospel. That's not it is a later work, yes? And that's the reason, that's the reason you find uh, after 90 years, yeah, like you said, it is written when these, some of these people were not even alive then. By the way, did Luke ever see Jesus? No, Luke never claims to have seen Jesus. No, I'm asking you, I didn't say claim. So where did he get his information from? He said, I've carefully investigated all things by talking to, in, in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he says, I've carefully investigated everything so that you may know the exact truth of the things concerning Jesus the Christ. Now, how did he investigate? Did he speak to the eyewitnesses? He, he talked to eyewitnesses. Yeah. And whom did he write for? He wrote for Christians. No, whom Theophilus, did he write for? The lover of Who was Theophilus? Theophilus, you know, commonly, well, he could have been a, a real person or could have been just a person. What was his status? Lover of God. What was his status? The, uh, that we don't know. Well, he was a politician, okay? He was at that time an important politician to for whom he was writing. Why would he write something for a politician? Anyway, look, look it up, my friend. And if you can bring me the evidence, uh, my uh, email is, if you want to take it, you can email it to me, and I'll be happy to investigate. Because if I find evidence, then I'm going to make the same claims again, that there's no one from the Christian uh, um, New Testament scholars, credible scholars, who actually say, none of them actually say or claim that any of these four people wrote the Gospels. That's not true. I've written, I, I've read, I've read count. I would like to see some evidence. Okay. So. I'll, I'll give you my email. It's uh, dawawise at gmail.com. And then you let me know where, in which book, give me the reference, and I'll check it out. So that's, that's my channel where you, can, where you will also find this video. Uh, Dawawise at gmail.com. And yeah, watch the video and give us a feedback if you can. But uh, really appreciate you speaking and spending your time. Has Hashim. Hashim. Yes. All right, Jeff. Pleasure you. take care, mate. All right. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I've been watching the videos for four years. Yeah, it's